Welcome to our lecture today on drug targets, nucleic acids, DNA, and RNA. This lecture should for the most part be a review for most of you. We're going to highlight uh, the structure of DNA and RNA and uh, really go quickly through this and point out some of the specific targets, um, specific enzymes that can be targeted um, when nucleic acids uh, are targeted as drug targets. So let's begin quickly here. We'll begin with the primary structure of DNA. Obviously nucleic acids include both DNA and RNA and uh, when we talk about the primary structure of, um, of DNA we're talking about the organization or the arrangement of uh, nucleotides inside of that um, uh, DNA chain. Now we begin with a begin with a uh, let me get the pen working here. You have a, a you have a phosphate, a sugar portion, and then a nuclear base. Okay. You have a sugar portion here. And then you have a nuclear base. Okay. Now there is a numbering system here for the sugar, one prime. This will be a two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime position. And um, this is the five prime end, and this is the three prime end here. Actually, at the bottom here will be the three prime end. Okay, so this is just another representation of, uh, of the primary structure. And this shows us a sugar phosphate backbone, sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, so um, as you will see in the coming slides here, the building blocks of these nucleic acids are the nucleotides. In the case of um, DNA, you have the deoxy, deoxy, uh, deoxy because there is um, RNA has a ribose. Let me draw the ribose of RNA here. Okay, so RNA is going to have a ribose, DNA has a deoxy ribose, okay. So you have deoxy um, adenosine, I'll erase this. You have deoxy adenosine phosphate, uh, deoxy guanosine phosphate, deoxy thymidine phosphate, and uh, deoxy cytidine phosphate, okay. So the... Um, the bases um, are here, adenosine, guanosine, and you can recognize guanosine by the guanidino group here, uh, deoxytimidine, and deoxycytidine. So a nucleotide is phosphate plus sugar plus nucleic acid. Okay, so you have the phosphate plus the sugar plus the nucleic acid that gives you the nucleotide. The examples here, the oxyadenosine phosphate. Um, and the sugar is uh, the oxyribose. Now a nucleoside is only the sugar and then the base. So the nucleoside does not have, there is no, phos there is no phosphate group here. Okay. So these will be a nucleoside, deoxyadenosine, deoxyguanosine, deoxytamine, deoxycytidine. So this should be a good review for uh, for most of you guys. Now, as I've mentioned before, the sugar in DNA is deoxyribose, and the nucleic acid bases, there's four of them in DNA, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And there's a, the, the numbering for the ring is included here as well. Okay. The adenine and guanine are the purines, and uh, cytosine and thymidine are the pyrimidines. So when we look back again at that primary structure, you'll be able to see that now that you know the basis, that adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine are part of this um, small uh, nucleic acid here. And uh, the sugar phosphate, this portion here, is going to be constant. 
okay its portion is going to be constant uh, the basis then will be attached in a in a different order for each of the DNA uh, oligos and oftentimes I use oligonucleotide um, as as well as DNA or RNA because uh, DNA and RNA are both oligonucleotides. So looking at the secondary structure here, the secondary structure occurs when there is a um, when hydrogen bonding takes place between the bases in a way that allows the bases to interact with each other through hydrogen bonding and brings two individual DNA strands together. Okay, so hydrogen bonding between the Basis brings two individual uh, DNA strands together, and the uh, the phosphate backbone is on the outside, and the bases will interact with each other to be on the inside. Okay, so uh, the sugar phosphate uh, backbone is ionized because you have the phosphate groups that are negatively charged. They are going to face outwards. And then the nucleic acid bases are going to point outward. So the hydrogen bonding pairing occurs with between A and T and G and C. Purine pairs with pyrimidine. Is, so because the purine pairs with the pyrimidine, it allows you to have a constant diameter to the helix. Okay. Now, these base pairs, as when you look at the structure of these base pairs, they, they also have uh, pi systems in them. And so those pi systems can, can be stacked uh, via van der Waals interactions. When you look at the chains of, of DNA, they are complementary to each other. So you can look from one from one chain, you can deduce the other. G is always going to be paired with C. A is going to be paired with T. So if you have one chain, you can deduct what the other chain is made up of. So this is what we mean by those chains are complementary. There is a major groove. Uh, there is a major groove here. And then there's a minor groove here. Now these are important because uh, these are places where specific molecules are going to bind and interact with that DNA. And again, this is an expanded version of the picture that's on the left here. Okay. And again, these are complementary and uh, they run anti-parallel to each other. And what by anti-parallel I mean this chain here is going three prime to five prime, and this chain is going from um, is going the reverse. Again, good review. Um, the hydrogen bonding interaction that occur. If you look at the timing and adenine, that you have uh, two different hydrogen bonding interaction that occur, and then cytosine and guanine have three different um, hydrogen bonding interaction occurring now. For, for in the interest of full disclosure, you have some instances where the bases will actually uh, pair with each other differently than, than what we're showing here. But for the sake of this lecture, we'll only focus on uh, the most common type of pairing between um, the, the bases. All right, uh, replication is a process by which a, a DNA strand is going to reproduce, replicate as its, its, its name uh, means, as its names uh, implies. So you have new chains of DNA that are going to be synthesized based on the template of a parent DNA. Uh, and th this will give you a daughter helices, okay? Uh, DNA polymerase will be responsible for 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 this, but you also have a lot of other enzymes that will be that will be involved. Uh, Topo isomerase, there's many different enzymes that will be involved. Okay, we'll mention those as those enzymes as they uh, as they occur during the the lecture. So if you look at it, if you look at the replication based on the, specifically based on the uh, individual nucleic acids, individual um, nucleotides, so you have a growing chain. As we mentioned, those chains are complementary. So when you have a growing chain, the next and, and nucleotide that's going to be brought here is, is going to be A, because A pairs with, uh, with T. 
Okay. Now the base pairing takes place. You have hydrogen body interaction that occur, and then there's going to be a um, a, a reaction that's going to connect the G and the A, and we are going to look at the enzyme catalyte catalyzed splicing in detail in the next slides. So here we're looking at, at this here again, um, where you have a template, you have a growing chain, and you have the um, you have the the nucleo the nucleotide that's coming in, um, and hydrogen bonding interaction is going to to begin. After this takes place uh, between uh, tamidine and uh, guanosine here. And there's going to be an attack of the hydroxyl at the three prime position of the adjacent nucleotide, and it's going to attack at the uh, electrophilic phosphorus here, which leads to the release of um, these phosphodiesters are released and then the formation of a link between the three prime of the growing chain and the five prime of the incoming nucleotide. Okay. Now, as you can see, this, this, can be a, this can be of particular interest if you actually have a group that blocks, uh, a group that prevents the binding. If, if you were to replace this hydroxyl group by a group that is not capable of engaging in these interactions, or is not capable of being recognized by the by the enzyme, you can actually stop uh, DNA replication. Just like with proteins, uh, nucleic acids also have a tertiary structure. Okay. The tertiary structure occurs when the double helix is going to coil and form a 3D shape, and um, in order for replication to take place, uh, enzymes have to be involved in unraveling that uh, that coil, that three D shape, to to allow for DNA polymerase to uh, to work on the replication of the DNA chain. Now that unraveling, obviously, it is a lot of strain in the ch in the chain because. DNA wraps around itself multiple times, and there's a lot of strain in um, when the unraveling takes place. And there's an enzyme catalyzed uh, mechanism that comes in to cut and repair the DNA chain. And and the way it does that is is by um, br breaking one of the chains, relieving the the strain, so that the um, the process of replication can take place. Uh, that enzyme is toporisomerase. We have toporisomerase 1 and 2, and quinolone and fluoroquinolones inhibit that enzyme. Let me just introduce it to you here, toporisomerase. Okay. Now, toporisomerase 2, uh, again, it relieves the strain in the DNA helix. It cleaves the DNA, um, and then it cleaves the DNA to relieve the strain. And I'll actually show you a mechanism here. Toporisomerase has tyrosine residues or tyrosine amino acids. And those tyrosine amino acids are going to be involved in the breaking of the chain. The tyrosine residues are going to form covalent bonds to the DNA. Okay. Um, I have a more detailed picture. Now, although it looks like it's two different toporisomerase, I would like to point out that it's the same toporisomerase enzyme that is that is acting and breaking uh, on, on both of the strands here. So the enzyme is going to pull the chain apart to create a gap. It's going to create a gap so that this, uh, this strand here can actually, um, yeah, so it's going to create a gap so that th this strand uh, of DNA can be passed through, through the gap. And at the end of the process, um, the break is going to be resealed. So let's look at the mechanism of cutting. 
how they make them. So to process with the tyrosine and residues, um, it's going to again attack at the electrophilic position there, causing a not only does it cause a break of the DNA, but it also generates a covalent bond between topoisomerase and um, the um, and the fibrin position of that uh, DNA chain. Now let's talk as well about ribonucleic acid. Um, its primary structure is very similar to DNA. There's a few exceptions I've mentioned already. Ribose is used as opposed to the oxyribose for the sugar, and uh, uracil is used as opposed to uh, timing for the uh, for the base. Okay. Now the secondary structure DNA is single stranded. There are some regions of DNA of I'm sorry RNA is single stranded. There are some regional RNA that are actually going to exist in uh, as a as a double strand, um, simply because you have base pairing within this. You can have base pairing within the same strand, um, as in in tRNA, and, and we'll see it. Um, and um, adenine pairs to uracil and guanine pairs to cytosine. So as we take a closer look here at ribonucleic acid. Um, you have a tertiary structure that can also be generated. So there are three different types of RNA that are involved in protein synthesis, and they have different types of uh, tertiary structure. Messenger RNA, um, transfer RNA, and uh, ribosomal RNA. So messenger RNA is basically going to take the message, the information that is in DNA, and... Um, and take that code for the protein it is going to take it from DNA uh, to and that's what's going to lead to the production um, of um, so it's, it takes the information from DNA okay it's transfer is converted to messenger RNA okay and that messenger RNA is then going to go to the uh, protein production site okay now once it gets to the protein production site, you have a transfer RNA, a tRNA. Okay, the tRNA comes in, and the tRNA has specific amino acids. tRNA is such that it has specific amino acids. Okay, and then it has a portion here uh, that's going to be able to to bind or interact with uh, with the messenger RNA. Okay. And then the ribosomal RNA is present in ribosomes. It's, it's there. It's, it forms a important catalytic uh, and structural uh, portion of the RNA. It is at the production site for protein synthesis. And we'll look at more details about these different types of RNA. So uh, here you're looking at the tertiary uh, structure. And uh, this is transfer RNA. Transfer RNA has on, at, the, at, at one end amino acids. At the other hand, uh, transfer RNA has um, what we call anticodon. These anticodon are going to be able to uh, bind to and interact with, with messenger RNA. Okay. Now, I mentioned to you that there is the four major bases, uh, four major type of nucleotides, right? Uh, when, it's, when it comes to DNA, I mean, when it comes to RNA, you have A, U, uh, C and G. Okay. Now there are some other naturally occurring, um, natural occurring bases that they're different than the, the the four that we mentioned, but there exists in transfer RNA. Uh, for instance, you have uh, pseudouridin. Pseudouridin is right here. Uh, pseudouridin. You have uh, methyl. Inosine, okay, methyl inosine. You have inosine here. Um, you can also have ribothymidine. So a thymidine that's attached to a, a ribose as opposed to a deoxyribose. Uh, methyl guanosine is another one. Methyl guanosine is another one here that you see. Um, dihydrouridine is here. 
So you have some modifications in those um, in those um, in in in, uh, in RNA. Now those modifications are, are very important, and a lot of them are being studied to understand their evolutionary uh, contribution. Why 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 were they synthesized or generated? Can they be induced, or are they um, do they simply exist inside of the cell? So, um, as I mentioned, there's an anticodon binding region, therefore, uh, that, that's going to bind uh, to messenger RNA. It's going to bind to messenger RNA there. Okay. So, the base, base, these here are going to be complementary to uh, messenger RNA. So, you imagine, if you imagine, for instance, that there is something wrong that happens in the process with messenger RNA that you have you have from the time the DNA let me write that here so at any point during the process if, if there is any type of error that takes place okay you are going to have a different types of messenger RNA that's going to bind to a different type of transfer RNA that's going to lead to the generation of a different type of amino acid and that can lead to uh, proteins that are then defective. Okay. So when we talk about transcription, we're talking about the, the taking DNA uh, copying a, a segment of DNA which calls for a specific protein. Okay, so you take that DNA, and the part of DNA that's going to be that's going to be uh, used is the what we call the gene. So DNA is in is is in revel to reveal a gene. That's a portion of the DNA. Okay, then that gene is going to be converted to uh, to messenger RNA. That's that's through transcription process. That messenger RNA then is going to be uh, taken to the site of, of of protein synthesis, and transfer RNA is going to be able to come and bind to that messenger RNA based on the type of codons that it has. Okay, so now the translation process um, inside of the ribosome, mRNA is going to come in and bind it to the ribosome. And then you have the growing chain of the protein that's going to be at the P site. The incoming um, amino acid is going to be at the A site. Then there, there's going to be an attack um, where the incoming amino acid is going to attack the, uh, the protein. Let me, I'll show, I'll show that to you in detail here. Um, I'll show that to you in detail in the next slide. So the the transfer RNA that used to have the protein chain is moved out of the P site, and then the growing chain here and the growing chain here is going to move to the P site to open the A site uh, for the next amino acid um, that's going to be carried with tRNA. And then so on and so forth. The process continues until you have um, the full length protein. So now let's look at this in detail here. So um, you have your tRNA that's attached to to uh, that's going to be interacting here, and uh, this is all inside of the ribosome. All inside of the ribosome. Okay, you have the tRNA is interacting with uh, with messenger RNA so this is messenger RNA this is the P site and this is the A site okay so this is the growing peptide chain here growing peptide chain and this is the new amino acid that's that's coming in it's gonna be an attack here um, these lone pairs are going to attack at the carbonyl that are going to cause uh, a release of this peptide 
from um, from the sugar of the tRNA here and is going to lead to the synthesis of this peptide bond here. So there's a transfer of growing peptide chain to the next amino acid and then uh, the tRNA is going to get out of the P site, leave the ribosome, and then this growing chain is going to move into where the tRNA was before. So we're going through that again so that you see. Uh, now it's easier for you to steer to understand what's happening. So the, the histidine containing tRNA comes in. Uh, then there's a peptide transfer that's going to take place and then um, the, the tRNA that used to have the growing chain is going to be removed from the P site. Then this is going to move into the P site. Translocation is the proper word and open the, the A site for the next a transfer RNA to come in. The transfer RNA that comes in has these codons here that are actually going to be able to hydrogen bond with the messenger RNA and the reaction keeps going. Okay. So let's look at the overview. So um, DNA is going to be um, you unwind the DNA to reveal the gene Okay, that portion of DNA is going to be converted or, or um, is going to be transcribed transcription through the process of transcribe transcribed into into messenger RNA. Okay, that messenger RNA then is going to be translated into um, into protein through the process. So messenger RNA goes into the ribosome. It's it it's bound to the ribosome now. Uh, transfer RNA is going to come in with the amino acids occupy that P site there. The next amino acid comes in into the A site. Uh, there's a, a nucleophilic attack of the uh, nitrogen on a carbonyl group that's going to break the bond between the sugar portion of the tRNA and the peptide chain and create a new bond between uh, the incoming amino acid and the peptide. Then uh, the the tRNA that had originally the peptide chain is going to be removed from the P site. The new tRNA that now has the peptide chain moves into that P site, opens up the A site so that the reaction can keep going. That's the process of translation. So you go from DNA to RNA to protein. That's the central dogma. Central dogma. And this process continues until you have a full protein. Now, there are modifications that can occur to, um, to messenger RNA prior to translation. And so you, you think about it, how you have um, transcription. You begin with DNA, right? You begin with DNA and so you have that piece of messenger RNA that's been uh, transcribed from DNA but there are some portions of that RNA that will not be translated to protein so once that mRNA is synthesized you have exons intron and and these you have a, a specific machinery in the cell called the spliceosome the spliceosome is going to come and cut off the portions that are not needed for that particular protein and it's going to be excised and then you have a process where the pieces that are needed are going to be uh, linked together and that's what's going to be processed um, in the process of translation. So those modifications can occur uh, at different places and so the intron is the inside portion, the exons are the outside portion, they're spliced together and splicing requires a spliceosome, which is also of interest, also of interest. Um, RNA in spliceosome is called small 
small nuclear nuclear RNA, small nuclear RNA, and uh, so the small nuclear RNA is going to align to the, the it's going to align the target mRNA by base pairing to it. So it comes, it base pairs to it, and then that's this is how it does the splicing. All right, genetic engineering um, is. <clears throat> In genetic engineering, you use restriction enzyme to split DNA strands, a specific base pair region. You split that, you split it so that you can actually incorporate, um, you can incorporate genes that you want within that DNA. Okay, so oftentimes you have sticky ends that result from that uh, from that splitting because some of the restriction enzymes, the way they they cut the DNA gives rise to uh, sticky ends and these sticky ends will allow for uh, annealing in the process. Now DNA ligase then comes in and, and, and links back uh, the pieces together. Okay. Now uh, you can add segments at, at both ends of a DNA fragment uh, so that that DNA can be recognizable to a specific type of restriction enzyme. And oftentimes we use a, plus, a, a, a vector DNA like a plasmid where you can splice that plasmid and then uh, incorporate a human DNA in it using ligase to... So you splice it, you're going to have some sticky ends and based on the sticky ends, then you can incorporate a human DNA uh, that's going to go in and base pair with the um, vector uh, plasmid uh, DNA. So those plasmid are circular uh, segments of DNA. They, these are transferred between bacterial cells, and you can insert a gene in there. So for instance, you let's say you're trying to study um, the NSP12 of SARS-CoV-2. That's the process that you will use. You buy the specific genes, then you will splice a plasmid, incorporate it, you splice a vector, incorporate the genes into that vector, and then allow that vector to uh, generate as much protein as you need for the synthesis for, so that you can study that protein. Phage are specific, bacteriophages are specific viruses that infect um, bacteria. So it is possible to introduce a gene into a phage. That phage then is going to infect the bacteria. And then the, once the phage infects the bacteria, the machinery of the bacteria is going to produce the genes that we need. <coughs> So multiple copies of the bacteriophage is going to be produced because um, it's infected the bacteria and uh, it takes over the machinery of the cellular machinery of the bacteria to produce multiple copies of that gene. All right. I hope this was a good review for you guys. Um, next lecture is going to focus on specific drugs that uh, affect nucleic acid.